Well, I think it I think it will ultimately drive more adoption um, because it creates an opportunity to deliver these products and services in a way where it doesn't always have to be primarily Bitcoin. So if someone, for example, that is unbanked, and maybe that's not part of BlockFi's addressable market, but just step away from BlockFi for a second. If they're going to access a financial system that's not the traditional financial system, I think we could probably agree that right now it doesn't make sense for them to have all of their money in Bitcoin. So wouldn't they be more likely to start using this new financial system to power the majority of what they're doing if they also had the ability to hold other assets like traditional fiat currencies while they're still around and before they get taken over by Bitcoin? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, where you get to hear from the best minds in Bitcoin and crypto. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and this week I have an interview with Zach Prince from BlockFi. But first, I do have a message from my show sponsors. So let's talk about Deribit, the rapidly growing futures and options exchange for cryptocurrencies. So why are they growing so quickly? Well, firstly, they've never been hacked, which we all know is a massive problem in crypto. They've designed their tech stack for stability so they don't experience system overload crashes like you see with other trading platforms when the prices go crazy. They can easily support high frequency trading and they allow for instant withdrawals and they've never once had a socialized loss, which is pretty cool. So if you want to check them out, they do have an offer. You can get a 10% discount for your first six months on the platform. Just head over to derabits.com. That's derabits with an S, which is D-E-R-I-B-I-T-S dot com. Derabits with an S dot com. And please note, Derabit is not available for US citizens. Okay, so on to my interview with Zach Prince from BlockFi and for full transparency, those who listen to the show regularly will know they've been a long-term sponsor of the podcast. So I've taken their ads out this week. It kind of, I kind of thought it sounded a bit weird having a BlockFi advert followed by a BlockFi interview with Zach. So yeah, I've taken them out. And just for like transparency and the skeptics out there, I've not been paid for this interview. When they originally became a sponsor back in September, I, I was actually offered an interview, but I rejected it. I didn't think talking about Bitcoin back loans would be something that would make for an interesting podcast. But after I heard Zach on both Pomp and Stephen Levera's show, I realized that what BlockFi is doing is actually quite interesting. And the debt and credit services around Bitcoin and the future of banking is actually quite an interesting topic. So as I was heading out to New York, I reached out to Zach and said, look, come on, let's do this. Let's record a show. Come on, come on the podcast. Let's talk about BlockFi. Let's talk about what you're doing. And let's talk about how you see the future of banking. But yes, I know how skeptical people in crypto can be. And people probably think I was paid for this, but I wasn't. And please don't get in touch asking to come on the podcast if you become a sponsor, because it will be a, almost certainly a no. Um, also, I want to say a big thanks. Following last week's interview with Hester, all the positive feedback has been pretty incredible and really overwhelming. So many people have shared the show out. I've received so much amazing feedback and it's on track to be the most downloaded show I've ever had. So just a big thanks to anyone who helped with that. Hester herself, anyone who shared it and anyone who's got in touch. I really do appreciate that. And if you want to support the show, there's so many things you can do. I do have a support section on my website. If you can take a couple of minutes and have a look at that over at www.whatbitcoindid.com. There's a whole list of things you can do to help me keep the show going. And I hope you enjoy the interview with Zach. If you do have any questions, you know you can always reach out to me. It's hello at whatbitcoindig.com. Hi, Zach. How are you? Hey, Peter. Great to see you in person. Yes. Great to meet you in person. Thank you for getting me a beer. Of course. We've got uh, four more. I was uh, I was only kidding when I emailed you asking for a beer, but now I've got it. I'm really glad. Is this, is this a Thanksgiving thing? Do you drink a lot of Thanksgiving? I was actually at a holiday party last night where I drank a little bit. So when you emailed me about the beer, I got a little scared, but I've now had two sips of a beer and I feel I feel better. I feel bad, actually, because your wife wants you home for Thanksgiving, doesn't she? She does. We were supposed to record at like 7 o'clock tonight, I think, but we moved it up, which uh, she appreciates very much. But it does show our dedication. The night before Thanksgiving, in the midst of a bear market, we're working. We're working. This isn't really working, though. Not for me. This isn't working. Um, But great to finally meet you. And also, thank you, because you are a long-term sponsor of the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to support the show, and we're big fans ourselves. So we should probably prepare for the incoming accusations that I've been paid for this interview. So how many Bitcoins did you give me for this interview? I think you gave us a discount. We only gave you like 25 Bitcoins for this one. (laughs) So it was quite funny, actually, when you first sponsored and I looked at it and I thought, um, no, I'm I'm not interested in any of this credit market stuff because it sounds really boring. 
And I do actually get offered sometimes, people offer to pay to come on the podcast. It was only after you became a sponsor and then I listened to the interview with Pomp and I in, then listened to the one with Stephen Levera. And I realized this is actually incredibly important part of the market and I know nothing about it. So I'm going to be a complete noob today and I want you to teach me everything you know about this. Um, but firstly, can you just let me know your background prior to BlockFi? What have you done for the last, what, 20 years? Yeah, sure. So uh, I put myself through college as a professional poker player. So I you know, was fortunate to come out of school debt free and um, had my first experience with you know, risk management and markets and uh, things like that uh, in college. And then since graduating, I've always worked at venture backed technology companies. I was fortunate early on to be a part of two companies in the advertising technology sector that were successful, one that was acquired by Google. Um, and then more recently, before starting BlockFi uh, in the financial technology sector, specifically the lending side of financial technology at two different companies, one Orchard, which was basically in the middle of the online lending ecosystem. And we had data products, technology products, regulated entities. We created a broker dealer, an RIA, an ATS. And we worked with all of the large online lenders, Lending Club, SoFi, Prosper, OnDeck, and then institutional capital sources who were either buying those loans or lending to those companies. Uh, and after Orchard, I went to a, a consumer lending business that had a uh, retail integration strategy. So we were basically like a PayPal credit or uh, an Amazon credit type product, except geared towards uh, individuals that didn't have strong credit scores or weren't based in the U.S. and thus didn't have a credit score at all. Right. So tell me about the poker, because I used to play poker and... I played it quite a lot, actually. Um, when I was younger, I did a lot of online poker, though. Not, I don't know if you call it professional, but I make quite a bit of money to begin with. But were you playing just online, offline, everywhere? <clears throat> yeah, so you know, I did, I did some air quotes when I said professional because it was definitely online. But basically, in high school, we had a, a guy's poker night, you know, just buddies, and we would play. And I won consistently because I kind of read some books and just got really into it. And then I got my first debit card when I went to college. And I took $25 off of this debit card, deposited onto a poker site, and in short order had turned you know, the $25 into a few thousand dollars. And uh, at a certain point, I decided that I was going to quit my work-study job because <laughs> I, I wasn't making nearly as much money as I thought I could playing poker. And um, I played Limit Hold'em, uh, 8 to 12 tables at a time, party poker, poker stars, all the big you know, sites back in the day. So you know, shorthanded Limit Hold'em all online. What, were you playing the um, sit and goes? I played tournaments a little bit at the beginning, but I moved. I, I switched into into cash games right. uh, as I got you know more experienced. Because I was playing on uh, Victor Chandler, and I was playing the six seat sit and go fifty dollar tables, and I played three at a time. And I was probably not a lot. But I was probably making two or three hundred pound a day. Mm -hmm. You know, I got the numbers right, I got the odds right, just to start making some money but didn't spend any time with my family. It becomes quite addictive, right? It becomes addictive. You're staring at a screen all day. And, you know, that combined with here in the U.S., uh, a law was passed in 2006, I believe, called the UIGEA, Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act, where they basically uh, made it so that financial institutions were not allowed to send money to these poker websites. Um, and that basically dried the games up a lot because it got a lot harder for anyone who needed to deposit more money onto the sites to do that. Yeah, I found, I, I think I started to come up against the bots as well. And I had a bit of a loose game, but it kind of worked. But when I stopped playing for a few years and they came back, almost the same strategy. And I was hardly winning at all. I found it really, really hard. Did you read Doyle Brunson's Super System? I probably did. I went through so many poker books. It was the one where you had the famous 10-2 hand. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to remember what happened. There was a oh, a card was dropped. So they had to redo the deck and they showed the cards and he would have lost. And he, he won this famous hand. And that was the first book I did. I think there's a lot of poker players in crypto. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's a it's a sector that if you're attracted to risk and, uh, you know, you like making bets that... Uh, there's just a lot of clear analogies from you know who would be the first movers in the online poker world to who would be attracted to the crypto sector. So you're basically saying we're all de degenerate gamblers? Not necessarily degenerate, but comfortable with taking risk, right? I mean, clearly crypto isn't for someone who uh, you know only wants to invest in uh, government bonds 
<laughs> it's uh it, it's a bit farther out on the risk spectrum yeah certainly not now um god we're what 10 months into a bear market now and i'm surviving other people are, are surviving but it's i think it's been pretty brutal and actually you're starting to see some quite sad stories and sad tweets now um i think it's kind of been proven to a lot of people this isn't easy money right yeah it's a different time you know it's uh it's a different time now than it was a year ago i think there's a lot of good things that will ultimately come out of this it's a learning experience um but i also think that obviously you know prices got a bit ahead of themselves and you have to be when it comes to your finances aware of uh what your goals and objectives are and your risk tolerance and uh thoughtful around when you make an investment why you're making that investment and how you plan to manage that investment um but yeah it's it's definitely a different it's a different feeling in the in the room if you're at a conference or uh you know, going to a meetup than it was a year ago. Yeah. You went to a lot of the early meetups, didn't you? Yeah, that's actually part of what drove me to start BlockFi is my, you know, at a certain point in uh, 20, early 2016, my wife said, you're talking about Bitcoin, you know, way too much and I don't want to hear about it. So you need to go find some friends that you can talk <laughs> about this with. And, you know, I watched the composition of the meetups uh, change from 2016 to early 2017. Obviously, the sector was attracting a lot more attention. There were some uh, venture capital investors and bankers in addition to, you know, some of the earliest uh, earliest adopters that started attending. And, and that was part of what motivated me to, you know, make the decision that I just had to get involved myself. Right. And does your wife talk about Bitcoin now? She actually does a right. little bit. Not, okay. not nearly as much as me, but... Uh, a little while after I started BlockFi, or, or in, as I was in the process of starting BlockFi, she started investing herself. Right, so she, um, she bought some Bitcoin. Yeah, she did. I, I also got her parents to invest in Bitcoin and Ether. <clears throat> they asked me if they should buy the Snapchat IPO. And I right. said, if you're thinking about buying the Snapchat IPO, yeah. one, I don't think you should do that. And two, I've got something way better for you. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, And then a couple months later... Uh, Angela's mom sent me a text message saying, this investment is performing so well, but I think I'm getting addicted to checking the price. But we all did. Yeah, absolutely. I'm getting addicted to not checking the price these days. <laughs> <laughs> then come back and see it's dropped another thousand dollars. It's uh yeah. Not great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna want to ask you about the impact of the bear market on BlockFi, but I think we should unpack the company first, talk sure. about that first. So at what point did you decide that you wanted to start the company, you know, and how did it go from an idea in your head to us being sat here now with a, an office in New York and a team? Sure. So uh, basically at the beginning of last year, I decided that I had to do something in, in crypto. And um, after having an experience with a bank where they basically scoffed at the fact that I had Bitcoin and Ether as, you know, assets on my financial statement and almost declined to work with me. Uh, the light bulb went off in my head that this sector that I had been working in, the online lending sector um, and debt and credit markets, uh, was going to be needed in the crypto sector just like it is in every other major asset class. And that uh, given my background, um, it was a very logical thing to do. And yeah, I called a law firm that I've worked with a lot in the online lending world and said, hey, so is there a product that I could create with without... Uh, you know, running a lot of uh, regulatory risk or handcuff risk. Is there is there a box we can put this in that would make sense from a legal and compliance perspective? And as soon as they said yes, I, you know, let the place I was working at know that I had to leave. Right. Okay. So job one, raise money. Job one, build a team. Build a team. Yeah. Get a few people because I, you know, I have some skills, but not that many. What uh, Build a team who are committed to come or actually start building, like, did you bootstrap it? Yeah, so we, we bootstrapped it with our own money for about six months, okay. uh, with three of us, and we got a you know kind of an MVP uh, developed, which was basically just a website describing the product in a in a very simple uh, application to you know understand if there are people that would be interested in borrowing money against their crypto, uh, and then you know during that time we were also working on raising money, right. and ultimately we're successful at raising a seed round in December of last year. How many investors? There were probably seven or eight investors in that round. It was led by Consensus Ventures. Right, okay. 
and we had uh, SoFi participated, Point Judith Capital, PJC, which is a venture firm out of Boston, Kinetic Capital, which is a venture firm out of Hong Kong, and then a few angel investors, uh, you know, former CEOs of companies that we worked at or you know, friends that like to do some venture investing. And how much was that round? That round was $1.55 million. Okay. And then you've done a further raise since, right, with Galaxy? Yeah, so then we raised uh, $52.5 million that was led by Galaxy Digital this past summer. The okay. bulk of that is allocated specifically towards the lending activities yeah. versus being purely equity capital. You can't raise a small amount if you're lending money up, right? Yeah, I mean, basically the product is money, so you need a lot of it. And I guess if the product's really successful and you end up lending pretty much the majority of it out, is it quite easy then to borrow more? And who... Who tends to lend in this? Do you go out to traditional capital markets? Bear in mind, remember, I know nothing about this. But all I know is like, I know, say, for the banks, the high street banks who lend to to uh, provide me with a mortgage, they borrow from elsewhere, right? So there's markets you can raise capital from. Explain that to me as somebody who doesn't know anything. Sure. So it's uh, there's a few different paths that you can go down, but you can think of the the buckets as basically being... Uh, private credit markets, institutional private credit markets, so uh, hedge funds, family offices, um, more public credit markets. So that's like bond markets with banks uh, and then retail investors. And we decided that the place we thought made the most sense to start was in that first bucket, the private credit markets. And there's a number of different uh, asset management firms who specialize in you know, alternative lending. Right. Um, a lot of them were the biggest participants in that online lending sector that I that I worked in previously, and so we felt that uh, that that was the best place to start. But over time, we will be diversifying the places where we're raising capital from for lending into the other buckets as well. Right. And I I think it's really exciting to think about you know banks starting to participate in this sector because it'll just make it that much more resilient. From a regulatory perspective, from a cost of capital perspective, uh, so so we're actively working on that, and we'll have some announcements about banking partners yeah. that are extending credit to BlockFi to facilitate the lending that we're doing, uh, probably coming out before the end of the year. And when you're borrowing money to lend out as a capital to people who want to take out loans, are you giving away equity in the business for that money, or is the are there is it just some kind of guaranteed interest they get? It depends. There's a lot of different structures that you can do it in. Galaxy invested, uh, you know, on the equity side as well. So they, you know, just like a venture capital firm would, they invested uh, equity in the business, and then they separately created a vehicle with committed funds to back the loans. Right. And basically, the way it works is, you know, they have a return that they will receive, and then BlockFi makes, you know, a percentage uh, of that. So right, okay. back of the envelope math, if we were charging 8% on a loan, maybe 7.5% of that would go to Galaxy or another investor and half a percent would go to BlockFi. Okay, so it's it's quite a small amount you take off the uh, of the interest, right? Yes. So with, with lending, uh, you need a lot of scale before the revenue numbers start to get interesting. So having a lot of money available to lend and and doing it in a market where you can you know facilitate hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars worth of transactions is really important yeah so if you lent out a hundred million you would make around half a million from that that's directionally yeah. accurate directionally accurate yeah yeah so i'm just trying to understand what's the scale you're going for as a business like like uh, i'm almost like what's the trajectory in the timeline you know because you're going to have creative forward projections are you predicting this is going to be a you know a 20 billion dollar market within five years you know what, what kind of predictions are you making for this sure so we think of the addressable market for the product that we have now which is a u.s dollar loans secured by bitcoin for example as collateral as being one to three percent of the total market cap of the assets that we're lending against. Okay. And that number comes from uh, the margin debt to stock market cap ratio from the public equities sector. So, you know, you can kind of back into if crypto is around 100 billion right now, we think we could lend against one to 3% of that. 
maybe the penetration rate for margin debt is a little bit higher because crypto is international. So having access to low cost capital, if you're someone in a market where that's not typically available, could drive that penetration ratio uh, a bit higher. Um, but really, the way we build a very large company is by diversifying our product set and not just offering mm -hmm. you know, margin loans, but also having other products and creating a uh, you know, customer relationship and product suite where we can do more than just loans backed by your Bitcoin. Right. OK, so the two things I find really interesting about BlockFi, which I confess I've learned more about in the last few weeks for them when you first advertised when you first advertised obviously i took a look and you know i was like okay it's just kind of local loans and i didn't really get it i just I didn't fundamentally understand it actually um until i kind of started looking into it and in a bit of detail and, and the thing two things i really like about it it's like firstly you might you might disagree with this but essentially you are kind of a crypto bank correct okay so you're comfortable with that 100 percent. we have to be a little careful about when we use that word, because it comes with a lot of regulatory burdens in the United States specifically, but yes. And, and that's something I really want to unpack with you and we'll come on to that. But also, I think what is really interesting is that you're really legitimizing crypto in that you are creating traditional financial products with crypto. And I find that super interesting because it legitimizes it with the, because you're going to be working with a lot of traditional capital markets right and blending crypto with traditional is just legitimizing it absolutely and and what's really exciting about it is that you can deliver these banking products because you're operating in a crypto first world at a uh, global and digital scale that wasn't possible in a traditional banking context because everything was kind of defined by what market are you operating in? There's all these legacy technology systems associated with every part of the process. But if we can build this new infrastructure, starting from a blockchain and crypto first mindset, still bring in capital from that old world, but really just rethink how do you deliver these products? Where can you deliver these products? And how do you deliver them against Bitcoin? Yeah. Then that's, you know, that's what we get really excited about. And having not spent time working here, I don't know how you guys have you know, plan your strategy for the future. But I'm assuming, therefore, emerging markets are actually quite exciting. Yeah, ab you, absolutely. You're going to be able to provide services that, uh, you know, that banking the unbanked, it gets said a lot. But actually, and I don't, I never know what it actually really means. You know, you can give somebody uh, services on their phone, but you are actually now going to be able to provide services in emerging markets to people who can't get them elsewhere, right? Yeah, and, you know, for the for the foreseeable future, it's more of a, private banking, the you know normally banked or insufficiently banked because we aren't really today creating products for um, you know people that have call it you know less than a thousand dollars of total net worth and really just need a place to put five dollars of their savings in an app for example. Um, but yes, delivering at a global scale and that credit functionality and the low cost credit functionality is really really big. So in traditional markets, borrowing dollars from outside the U.S. is an $11 trillion and rapidly growing market. So that's companies and governments tapping into U.S. credit markets because they're cheap and they're large and they're available. And that's never been available to retail before. Right. And so if we can use Bitcoin as a mechanism to lend against and offer sub 10 percent cost credit in markets where it's usually not available and certainly not available to retail investors. We think that's a really attractive value proposition for the customer and also a really valuable utility for Bitcoin to have. Right. So, okay. Okay. So let me ask you a couple of questions because uh, like I've got some ideas that I go around in my head after you said that. So I wasn't aware of this US dollar borrow market, um, corporate market, and you're saying you want to open that up to retail. So, if you were to open it up to say, give me a good example. What's a good, uh, like, would Argentina be a good example? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so somebody in Argentina wants to borrow. It becomes easier because of online facilities, right? Online facilities are there. I'm assuming there's certain regulations or certain licenses you have to have to operate within the Argentinian market. Sure, sure. Okay, so somebody wants to borrow. They want to borrow ten thousand dollars. 
let's say in the scenario they've got Bitcoin, so they've got twenty thousand dollars of Bitcoin, they've received the loan. How do you get them dollars when they have a account which isn't denominated in USD? So right now what we're doing is we're using the fiat backed stable coins. So okay. we have the ability to fund loans in GUSD, USDC, PAX, or true USD. Right. Okay. And if they are using an exchange which has services in Argentina, they can convert to their local currency. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So stable coins, which Maximus hate, and I've wanted to hate, for, actually can have a nice symbiotic relationship with Bitcoin in this scenario. Well, I think it, I think it will ultimately drive more adoption um, because it creates an opportunity to deliver these products and services in a way where it doesn't always have to be primarily Bitcoin. So if someone, for example, that is unbanked, and maybe that's not part of BlockFi's addressable market, but just step away from BlockFi for a second. If they're going to access a financial system that's not the traditional financial system, I think we could probably agree that right now it doesn't make sense for them to have all of their money in Bitcoin. Yeah, of course. So wouldn't they be more likely to start using this new financial system to power the majority of what they're doing if they also had the ability to hold other assets? Right, okay. Like traditional fiat currencies while they're still around and before they get taken over by Bitcoin. Is it, but do you believe that will happen? I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know. I think... Um, there's a lot of things that could point you in a direction that the dollar being the reserve currency of the world is not something that will still be true 50 years from now. Yeah. I find it hard to understand what steps might occur in between now and then and what that would look like, but I don't rule it out as a possibility. Yeah. So, I mean, you're arguably not just a crypto company, you're a fintech company too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So do you also then see a scenario whereby you may lend without collateralizing, collateralizing with crypto? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things we intend to launch next year is a credit card, an unsecured credit card, where instead of dollars or airline miles, you can earn Bitcoin as cash back. And that's wow. just a traditional unsecured loan i want one <laughs> but we've got the money we've got the yeah. understanding of credit markets we've got the banking relationships we've got the connectivity into the bitcoin world we know you know our customers are the exact type of people who would be interested in that type of product we think we're in a really good position to bring it to market okay wow okay that's that's really interesting okay so let me just go back a step um hmm so I th let's talk about the product first and how it works because there's a few th we're not even going to get onto the questions i've written down otherwise um even though this is super interesting so the talk me through what a, cus a customer has a certain amount of bitcoin they want to take out a loan what is the process online to take out the loan what do you check do you do credit checks so we do a public record check to look for whether or not someone, basically, if we're lending in the U.S., whether or not they have a lien from the federal government because they owe them taxes. Right, okay. Um, other than that, we're not looking at FICO scores right now or checking other credit variables. And the way the process works is someone comes to our website. Typically, they read a lot of the educational you know, type articles that we have, either about lending in general or about specifically our product. Then they play with uh, a loan calculator that we have up on our website to understand more of the function and pricing and, and how it all works, then they apply. And applying takes you know less than a minute. It's just like creating an account on Coinbase, for example. They receive a decision, receive a loan offer, assuming that they want to move forward. They sign that, send their crypto that they'll be using as collateral, and then we either wire funds to their bank account or okay. fund their loan using a stable coin if they've selected that option. And you use something called uh, loan to value, right, LTV? And it's around 50% now? Yeah, up to 50%. Up to 50%. So you can borrow up to half the value right. of your Bitcoin on the day that you're borrowing. Okay, and I send you my Bitcoin. You keep that in some kind of badass cold storage. We, we custody it with uh, with Gemini. Okay. So we take advantage of their uh, you know kind of tried and true cold storage system. They've got 
insurance and uh, you know regulatory designations and legal liability, mm-hmm. and they custody billions of dollars of crypto assets. So we we keep everything with them. Okay, so say I buy, say I borrowed five thousand dollars of you. I see ten thousand dollar Bitcoin, which was half a Bitcoin a year ago. It's two Bitcoin now, <laughs> two and a half. Um, I send you the Bitcoin. Price crashes to a thousand dollars. What happens? So uh, along the way, you will receive notifications from BlockFi that your required loan to value ratio is at risk of not being maintained. There's a few different levels. Um, First, there's some notification levels, then there's an official margin call level, and then there's a final level where we sell a little bit of the Bitcoin before it's worth less than the amount that we lent to you. Right, okay. Okay, so in some ways it's also like trading, right? If you can get a margin call on a loan, You've got to be considering price. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Right. You you are making a a trade of sorts by deciding to use a product like this. Yeah. What usually is different for our customers is that it's more of a wealth management type of trade versus a I'm investing in something for the first time. Right. So it's usually most of our clients are individuals or companies who have held Bitcoin for a long time. They've already made the trading decision that they want to be long Bitcoin. Yeah. And then they might have large embedded capital gains in that position. So even though Bitcoin's down a little bit this year, I'm not sure when you originally purchased it, you might still have a very large gain there, but you want some cash to make another investment or diversify your assets or start a company or purchase a house. And by not selling the Bitcoin, you're saving yourself that tax expense and you're keeping your core Bitcoin position and still stand to benefit from future appreciation in the price of that Bitcoin. Okay. But say price does crash and I ignore the margin call. My account at some point becomes liquidated, but am I do I have a debt with you for the difference? No. So we would we would sell Bitcoin along the way in small pieces and pay back your loan for you right so it's not that you wake up one day and we're like your bitcoins were not worth nothing and you still owe us a bunch of money next up i talked to zach further about BlockFi and how he sees the future of banking but before that i have a message from my show sponsor so Deribit, let's talk about them again i mentioned in the intro how fast they're growing so why is this well firstly they have never been hacked They design their tech stack for stability so they don't experience system overload crashes like you see with other trading platforms when the prices go crazy. They can easily support high frequency trading and they allow for instant withdrawals and they have never once had a socialized loss. Right now they are Bitcoin only futures platform offering up to 100x leverage for you crazy leverage traders out there. Perpetual contracts with up to 100x leverage too and they are the only liquid Bitcoin options market in the world. So go and check them out. They do have a special offer for the listeners of the podcast. You can get a 10% discount on your first six months of trading. Just need to head over to deribits.com. That's with an S, deribits.com with an S, D-E-R-I-B-I-T-S.com. And please note, Deribit is not available for US citizens. But is, is there any risk to you there, it, like such a price crash that you haven't sold it in time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the yeah. risk that we manage or the risk that we are exposed to is there's no liquidity in the market and it gaps down an amount that leaves us underwater relative to the amount of money that we've lent out. Right. Okay. So that's the biggest risk. So I guess, you know, in some ways, like any startup, BlockFi is a bet on the future of crypto, right? Crypto dies, BlockFi dies. We are a long crypto business by design. Okay. And you are confident because... I think there's a lot of things that make me confident. So I go back to the uh, the slide from Blockchain Capital that resonated with me a long time ago about how Bitcoin is a platypus. And I still think it's very true. And the analogy was basically that when the platypus was first discovered, a bunch of people, you know, ex- uh, scientists back in Europe who were reading these, you know, discovery notifications called bullshit. Because how could there be an animal that has a beak like a duck, a tail like a beaver, fur like an otter, warm-blooded and lays eggs? doesn't exist. I think there's so many things that 
Bitcoin does that are better than comparables in the old world, which one is going to be the most successful, I think is still TBD. But I think any one of them alone is a trillion dollar plus opportunity. The market cap is still well below that. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. We're very bullish. And I was with um, Peter Van Valkenburg from Coin Center yesterday. And one of the things he said is they are aggressively coin agnostic. So even if you're a Bitcoiner, I'm guessing that doesn't really matter because you will provide products for coins that I guess have the right amount of liquidity. Um, I think I heard on, was it Pomp's show you said, or Stevens you said, that it would have, you think there may be large holders who would want to liquidate in it. So you're coin agnostic. We are... We are coin agnostic as a as a company. Yes, okay. personally, I'm. You know, my my crypto portfolio is dramatically weighted towards Bitcoin. <laughs> Actually, there was another thing I wanted to ask you about because I was thinking of you when I was in uh, the interview with Peter, and we were talking about state versus federal laws, and how with money transmission licenses you essentially have to apply for. I think he said there's. 52 because one state i can't remember again it came up twice yesterday montana it's like the one you don't have to apply for so have you had to apply for licenses in every single state not every single state but uh quite a few so we're uh subject to a similar regime as exchanges where it's a state-by-state -state regime and you've right. got to understand different laws and you know 52 52 different jurisdictions um but the licenses that we're getting are lending licenses. So it's the same type of information that the regulators want. You're subject to the same or similar levels of scrutiny. But there are some states where, for example, the threshold for whether or not you need that lending license is determined based on what rate you're charging. Right. And the idea is basically, you know, if you're charging a high rate, we want you to have a license. We want to know who you are because we don't want you, you know, coming to the great state of X and ripping off our our residents. So there are some states where we're able to operate without a license because we're lending at rates that are below that cutoff. Okay. But yeah, I mean, we spent uh, a lot of time in the first six months of the company explaining things to regulators, opening up our business plans and <laughs> financial models and, you know, kind of full kimono of, of information that regulators might want to know about us and getting the licenses that we needed. One of the things I have been finding though is that Regulators seem to be a little bit more open-minded and knowledgeable than I would have expected. Um, I've been very impressed when I watched the CFTC uh, hearing and when I watched the Senate testimony hearing with Nouriel and Peter. Like people, they really know their stuff, and they actually there are some people who are very open-minded, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think there's good and bad. Yeah. So there are certain regulatory bodies at the federal level that I think have done a great job. And I think overall the U.S. has done a pretty good job of not stifling developments and innovation, but trying to weed out stuff that is definitively bad, scams or frauds. Right, okay. But state regulators is, also, is a different story entirely. Yeah. Um, and we had some hilarious exchanges. I mean... We got the question one time, you know, what is a fiat currency? Well, look, I'm going to defend them, right? Because I hadn't heard of a fiat currency until a good few months into learning about Bitcoin. I was like, what do you mean a fiat currency? It's like the thing I've been using my whole life. So I didn't know. So should, we give them a, should we give them a chance there? Maybe a little bit, but to, to type that as a question to a, a <laughs> licensing applicant versus just Googling it is... <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess there's a difference though. Like, and it all comes down to like career and ambition and and resources. I guess if yeah, you're absolutely. if you're like if you're uh, in Congress, you've probably got a team of researchers, and you know, you probably want a successful career. And, and you know, if crypto is to be successful, you probably want to have been part of part of the people who are open minded to it. So, and I guess at state level, it's just it's just a different. We'd say kettle of fish in England. Do you say kettle of fish? It's, yeah, but we definitely say that it's just different. And uh, I'm complaining, but ultimately, you know, that regulator gave us our license and yeah, exactly. everything worked out fine. It's just right. So we know a bit about the product. I'm, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because you did cover it well with Stefan and and Pomp, and I'll just share those out in my show notes. I'd want to focus on a couple of other things. Sure. Firstly, 
how has a bear market affected you guys? Yeah, so we've been growing despite the bear market, which I think is you know primarily a function of just bringing a new product that didn't exist before into this market. So overall, our, our business has continued to, uh, to grow. But it's, it's stressful, you know, we're, where Lindy gets an asset that's uh, declining in price. We want to deliver a great experience to our customers and a margin call is basically never a good experience. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that we or our customers ever want. We'd prefer that that never happened. So um, it creates a, you know, it creates a, an operational burden that we have to, you know, manage. Um, is it a bit of a burden because, or a worry because you haven't essentially been through a process of a whole bunch of margin calls going out. You don't know how people are going to react. Is it the unknown? Well, it's, it's a little bit, it's not the technological challenge. Mm. So it's not that, you know, our system isn't capable of, you know, selling Bitcoin if we need to and notifying customers on an automated basis. It's, it's more the experience that we want to deliver and certain edge cases. So let's say we were really close to someone hitting a certain trigger, but they've initiated a transaction that only has one confirmation. Okay. W what do you do? Yeah. And it's, it's those types of things and our desire to uh, provide a level of flexibility and, and customer service that meets what you would expect from you know, the type of company that people envy for their customer service, whether that's Amazon or someone else yeah. in this, you know, highly volatile bear market, new ecosystem. And so it's more that stuff that's the challenge and not necessarily the technological side of it or the liquidity side of it. Because it makes me kind of think of, you know, when like you're at the airport and somebody's got there too late and they can't get on the flight and they're losing it. They're absolutely losing it. And... But everybody knows the rules. Everyone knows, like, you've got to be there 40 minutes beforehand. They know, and they're not there, and they get angry. I guess you've got potentially one of those same scenarios that they know the rules. Sadly, they've broken the rules. They've not uh, added funds to their account, and you've been, had to sell their Bitcoin. And they might, from that, be annoyed. They might leave you a bad review on, I don't know, some kind of review website, even though you followed the exact rules. That's the kind of scenario you're talking about, right? Yeah, and we've basically taken an approach of, you know, let the person on the plane. We're, right. we're not, you know, we're... For now. Correct. Yeah. But I, I think we'll always take that approach. Um, we've, we've designed the system in such a way that there's room there. We're not charging penalties when we liquidate people. So we're not motivated in any way, shape, or form. It's actually bad for us too. So we're kind of properly incentivized to make exceptions to, uh, you know, let that person onto the plane right? Okay. versus, you know, stand hard and fast by every line we drew in the sand. Have you found any use cases that you did not expect when you created BlockFi? You know, I think we were surprised by the level of demand we received outside the U.S. Uh, with very limited marketing. So it's surprised to the upside there. So one of the things that we adjusted on our roadmap was making the product available outside the U.S. faster than we had originally anticipated. Right, okay. I, you know, I probably thought that people would be using this primarily for like a, a wealth management type of purpose. And yeah. um, when we look at, uh, you know, the use cases for the loans that our clients provide to us, we've seen a higher rate of paying down higher cost debt and also just funding leisure activities than maybe I would have expected. Yeah. So, but, but for the most part, it's been, you know, our assumptions have largely been validated about who the types of people are that would want to use the product, what they're primarily going to use it for, uh, et cetera. And I guess right now, some people might be looking at the market thinking, wow, ah, these prices are low. I could take out a BlockFi loan and then buy more Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, we're not the, we're not the, best option if your if your primary motivation is to buy more crypto and you want to get a lot of exposure to more crypto there's you know companies like bitmex and others where you can get a lot more leverage than the amount of leverage that someone like blockfi would provide for 
But if you want to do that and you're looking for a long-term, low-cost, conservative form of leverage, if those words aren't too contradictory, yeah, then we are a good option. We have seen that as well. All right. Okay. All right. So the area I really want to explore with you, I think might be most interesting is if we kind of look at the evolution of banks, yeah, let's go pre-internet, high street bank. I don't know if you call them, but we call them high street banks in the UK. Is that like an investment bank, like a big diversified no, no, no. bank? Or... Like a, just like a bank where you and I would go have a bank account. Retail bank. Oh, right. Okay. So, so we call it high street bank. And if you need a checkbook or a card, you go into the branch, you have a, you queue up and you get what you did. And then, you know, 20 years ago, we started to get, maybe 15 years ago, some form of internet banking. You know, you can transfer some money, but you still have the same bank. And then with those bank accounts, they you know, move to mobile phones, so I can transfer money on my mobile phone now. So we had all that. And then we started to get the banks, which are mobile only. They've got no branches. You sign up, it's a mobile only uh, relationship. You know, they're growing. What is the next phase of bank, which is, you know, how do you, what are you seeing as the next phase of the banking? I think it's uh, companies that come without the regulatory burden of actually being a bank. And you're seeing this in some markets like China with Alibaba and Alipay and Ant Financial delivering banking like services. Right. Amazon is moving into payments. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of different fintech companies that are disrupting different parts of the banking infrastructure. And now with the crypto market, you have the opportunity to kind of rebuild it really from square one without as much of a reliance on, you know, centrally issued fiat currency. And the implication of that is that you can have, in my opinion, a more globally connected financial system than what we have today, which is very fragmented and where there's kind of winners and losers selected on day one, depending on what country you're born in. Right. So can you do envisage a scenario whereby I would open a bank account with BlockFi and have an account where I could get paid by my employer and that gets converted into some kind of stable coin and that I can pay my bills from there? Can you see that? Yeah, absolutely. I also think you could earn interest on your Bitcoin in that account at some point in the future. Um, and you could get access to different types of lending products, whether it's that credit card or a larger, longer term loan, like the ones we do now or, or different types of loans. And you could send money around the world for a lot lower cost and a lot faster than you can with other services today. So I guess when you start to think about it in that way this is why you're probably a bit more bullish because you can see a, just a much better banking system right yeah absolutely i think i think the term bank won't be used as much right. when we're talking about banking services 20 years from now i think it will just be the name of a company kind of like you know what amazon did for online shopping or what uber did for ride hailing services I think that same thing will happen to finance. I think crypto will be a part of that. And I think there will be a few winners and you'll say that name and it will just be the assumption that, you know, obviously that's where I'm doing my financial transactions. Block five. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Some people have told me we're going to have to change the name if we have a shot at becoming that big. <laughs> oh, why? Because it's not, um, I don't know. It's not like a single word. It's not you like know, Chase. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's... What do we have? In the, we have Lloyd's. Yeah, but we have some long... We have like Royal Bank of Scotland. So we have some bigger names. Um, who knows? Who knows? Who okay, knows? So, so what's the timeline of... And what, what can you tell me about new products and what is the timeline and for rolling out of these products and what's coming up for BlockFi? Yeah, sure. So... Um... Within the next six months, we'll, we'll be introducing uh, a couple of things. One, interest-bearing accounts, uh, at least for fiat-backed stablecoins and Bitcoin. We will also be introducing a lending product that takes your FICO score into account. So if you're, for example, someone that has an 800 FICO score in the U.S., uh, we will have a slightly different product in terms of margin levels and interest rates that uh, that is available to you. And then longer term, we'll be doing things with uh, credit cards, whether that's in the US, the 
you know, Bitcoin as your cash back or airline miles, uh, or internationally just having a piece of plastic that acts as the delivery mechanism for the loans that we're funding now, either via wire or stablecoin. Right. Okay. So, so looking at some of the traditional banks, the retail banks, do you think, are you a threat to them? Not today. We're, t- we're still, we're still small, but, okay. but, but absolutely. I mean, you could see a world where, um, younger people don't think of having a bank account. They think of having that relationship with, you know, an app or an online technology company that provides them the financial services. And in that sense, you could go through your entire life without having a account at an actual bank. Yeah. Maybe a bank does some things on the back end for that company. That's the front end that owns that customer relationship, but you could do all of the things that you need a bank for now without actually having a bank account in the future, I believe. Well, I guess it's just a natural progression, right? Money seems to have been the last thing that's become digitized with the internet. Um, I don't know where you're from, but I'm from a just a small town called Bedford. Very small town. And our high street now is very, very different from where it was 20 years ago. Um, I very rarely go there. I'll go there after, after to get a birthday card or, um, or I'll meet someone for a coffee, but I don't buy any clothes there. I don't buy any books there. The high street's become a lot of um, low-cost shops or charity shops, and there's a lot of empty shops these days. But we still have, every bank has a branch. So I guess that future scenario is where the banks don't have branches because they don't need them. And therefore, if the bank doesn't need a branch, it's an online bank. So where is it competitive? Uh, I think we'll go full circle. I think in the same way that you're now seeing companies like Amazon, who were online only, you know, purchase Whole Foods and start to open some Amazon stores, whoever that fintech company or handful of fintech companies are that provide the banking like services will come full circle as well right. and say, you know what, we were online and we, you know, delivered our product very successfully in a purely digital format, but actually our customers would probably love it if in select locations they could show up and talk to somebody, or maybe some of our customers want that. And we've built a large successful business, so why not do it? So a BlockFi, BlockFi branch. Yeah, I mean we've thought about we've thought about just having kind of office hours here. I guess it's um, so if somebody, educational, right? Yeah, if somebody wanted to come by and ask us questions in person or you know meet people on the team, they could. We actually had our first client appreciation event uh, a couple of weeks ago. We just hosted a you know pizza and beer happy hour type of thing here at the office and Mm -hmm. like 150 people showed up oh wow and we were like wow so you know tuesday night in new york (laughs) (laughs) you're offering beer and pizza that's true yeah so in terms of what you've got coming up and what you're working on and the sector as a whole what are the things that most excite you i actually get really excited about uh you know the transition away from tether and into more reputable uh tokenized fiat in the crypto ecosystem. I get excited for, you know, whenever we hit that point where people are able to say, yep, the bottom's in and we've made it to the other side and we can just focus on all of the cool things that have been built uh, instead of the price going down. And I'm just really excited about uh, seeing what all the smart people who have been drawn into the sector over the last year and a half are able to you know achieve and bring to the market. How do you feel about the whole stablecoin blacklist versus Bitcoin censorship resistance? I don't have super strong preferences uh, or opinions on that. My understanding in having conversations with some of the issuers is that while yes, that is a functionality that is there and was critical to be put there in terms of getting the approvals that they needed Mm -hmm. the likelihood that it's actually something that is triggered is incredibly low and effectively zero because the cost that one of these stablecoin issuers would incur by triggering that would be devastating to the business that they're trying to build of issuing these fiat-backed stablecoins right okay do you think there's too many stablecoins 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so which Some, is, somebody's got to win yeah. eventually. You know, there'll be one or two that are the standard. Remind me, which are the ones that you're working with? We're kind of, you know, we're working with, I think, what are the biggest four? It's uh, Paxos, True USD, uh-huh. USDC, and Gemini USD. Right. Okay. GUSD. Okay. Well, I'm conscious of time. Thanksgiving, and I know your wife wants you home soon. So thank you for, for doing this. Uh, before I end, I've got two questions for you. Sure. Okay. Firstly, what is Thanksgiving? Because I've got no idea. I've come. So basically, when I had this trip booked, I thought I'd do two days in Washington and two days in New York. And when I said to the people I know in New York, I'm going to be here, everyone was like, no, I'm away for Thanksgiving. Like, I've heard of it before, but I really don't understand why it's such a big deal. I don't know why it's a big deal either. I just know it's a day <laughs> that's a holiday. You get the family together. You eat, you know, turkey, ham. And the objective is to stuff your face as much as you possibly can. <laughs> and then maybe, you know, take a nap while you're watching some football. It sounds like Christmas without presents. It's like Christmas without presents. That's, Christmas yeah, without presents. Okay. Decent analogy. Yeah. Okay, fine. And um, what's going to come up for BlockFi in the next kind of few weeks, few months, and then years? And, and what should we be looking out for? Uh, we'll be... We'll be announcing some some new, very strategic investors to the platform and some partnerships that uh, will be making BlockFi products more easily accessible from other parts of the crypto ecosystem. So think about, you know, I have my crypto in XYZ type of storage. What if without moving it off of that, I was able to access, you know, a loan or other products from BlockFi in a really seamless and integrated fashion? So those things you'll be hearing, those are things you'll be hearing from us before the end of the year. And then first half of next year, launching new products, like some of the ones I talked about uh, on the show. Fantastic. Well, listen, look, firstly, thank you for being a sponsor because it's great. It keeps the show going. Uh, do truly, really, really appreciate that. And thanks to Brad as well, who I spoke to a lot and, and yourself. Um, let's just close out by letting people know how they can find out about BlockFi, how they can stay in touch with you guys, who you want to hear from, and uh, yeah, go from there. Yeah, sure. We'd love to hear from everybody. Um, our website is BlockFi.com. I can't imagine that people need to hear this. We're advertising on the show every week. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, no, because I was thinking, like, the week we have the show, do I do an advert? And I was thinking, well, you've paid for it, and I should. I was thinking about two things, that, and then how do I explain it to people? And, you know, there are going to be people who are going to accuse me of only allowing you on the show because you're advertising, just because, you know how negative and cynical crypto people are yeah sure so I was thinking, how do i handle that do i do an advert that week and i was like i don't know well we'll just roll with it anyway but yeah they know they know to go to blockfi.com forward slash what bitcoin did <laughs> boom so you know it better than me well I, I could probably repeat the uh the script now but uh but no, no they know that but like how do they stay in touch with you uh Zach, and you know and how should they stay in touch with what's going on with the product yeah you can find me on twitter my handle is blockfi zach you're free to email me anytime. It's Zach, Z-A-C at BlockFi.com. Uh, we have Telegram channels and, you know, all of the all of the normal kind of communication avenues. And I think um, we're generally really responsive. So don't be shy. If you have cool. questions, comments, thoughts, reach out to us. Brilliant. Well, look, thanks for coming on. Thanks again for being a sponsor. And thank you for getting me beer. And uh, I'll let you get home to your wife. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks to everybody who's a regular listener for... Uh, you know, hearing our names so many times and not uh, harboring any any bad feelings about it. Okay, great. Look, have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so what did you make of that? It's pretty interesting, right? As I said in my intro, I really just thought of BlockFi as a company providing loans for those who've got a, like a nice big stack of crypto, a way of avoiding a taxable event. But they appear to be so much more. Um, Chatting with Zach and also having listened to his other interviews, I realized they are kind of shaping the future of what banking might be integrated with crypto. So yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think it's kind of interesting how banking will change, how we might not use our retail banks. We might just be taking financial services from all kinds of companies in the future. So yes, I think that's pretty cool, pretty interesting. And just a big thanks to Zach for coming on the show and also their support as a sponsor. I really do appreciate it. I haven't run the ads this week because I think it would just sound a bit weird having the ads around the interview. But if you do want to check them out, they do have a special offer for my listeners. You head over to www.blockfi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did and you can find out more there. And look, if you want to support the show, there's so many things you can do. Just take five minutes. All helps me. If you if you enjoy the podcast, if you're one of the people who writes to me and says, I think you do an amazing job, just take a couple of minutes, check this out because it all helps. 
Firstly, you can consider becoming a patron. You can head over to patreon.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. I'm now up to 39. 39 people who are contributing to the podcast every month, which is so cool. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. You can become a show sponsor. If you're interested in doing that, you can email me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com. As I mentioned, downloads are increasing month on month. This month we are looking like I might crack through 100,000. I've already got through more than I got through last month, which is pretty cool. You can leave me a review on iTunes. I just had my first non-five-star review, which I thought was heartbreaking. Somebody left a three-star review, but that's fine. If that's what you think it is, if that's what you think I deserve, that's fine. But yes, please try and leave me a review on iTunes. And you also click on the subscribe button because apparently with Apple, the ratio of subscribers to listeners is good for my indexing. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Medium. I'm at what Bitcoin did on everything and feel free to reach out to me. You can also check out my website, which I'm always doing lots and lots of things on. You have all different ways you can navigate old podcasts and also you get transcriptions of all the interviews on there. That's www.whatbitcoindid.com. You can sign up to my newsletter on the website as well, where I do a daily Bitcoin email where I just curate all the best news blogs, podcasts in Bitcoin. So if you want to get that, head over to www.whatbitcoindid.com and click on the subscribe button and you can share this show out with your friends and family on social media. And I see it every time it happens. So a big thank you to everyone who does that. Okay, thank you for all the support I continue to get with the show. It really does help me continue to produce these interviews. And yeah, I just, I can't tell you how grateful I am. So yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you all have a great week and I will see you all soon.